Like I looked a bit at the profile of that uh, specific uh, FT journalist. Um, she, uh, I, I think she doesn't speak Chinese. Uh, she hasn't studied China. She goes to the country, you know, purely from the West, having been raised in that uh, environment where we, uh, liberal democracy, the way we view the world is the only correct one on China is wrong. And, uh, and so when you go with that mindset, which is very close minded, then, um, even though you don't, uh, that's unconscious in some way, uh, you try to justify that way when, when you're in China. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm quite excited because I got one of the best political analysts on Twitter X with me. My guest is Arnaud Bertrand, a French national living in Malaysia and one of the few people who doesn't post just their opinions, but data and analysis about global politics, especially East Asian affairs. Arnaud's Twitter feed is so informative that he appears on shows like Glenn Greenwald's System Update and gets cited by Jimmy Dore all the time. Arnaud, thank you very much for coming online today. Thank you so much, Pascal. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I've been for, watching your show for uh, for a long time, so I'm, I'm really honored to be to be invited. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a, a big honor on me because you your Twitter I can like only recommend it to everybody. I mean, your Twitter is so different from what what you read from others who like even my you myself included, who's just like, oh, I I find this is horrible, this is horrible, and you actually go and give us data. Like uh, today, you had like several really good uh, feeds, uh, Twitter feeds about a uh, 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 Financial Times report that is that is ridiculous and why it is ridiculous and, and and not just based on opinion, but then you you back it up with your own research. But we'll get to that in a second because I would first like to understand how is it that you you are an entrepreneur and you had you started a business and you're coming from actually from hotel background and now you're in political analysis on Twitter. How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, uh, what I'm writing on Twitter is uh, is basically a hobby that I do on the side uh, that I try not to spend too much time on, uh, maybe uh, one or two hours a day. I have a day job that has, I'm running a startup that has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with geopolitics. But basically, the story uh, is that, uh, so... Yes, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I created the first company in, uh, in, in, in Europe uh, back in the 2000s that did well. I sold the company to TripAdvisor. And then um, I basically had the opportunity to start a new life. Uh, and I moved to China because uh, my wife is Chinese and uh, we thought it would be better to educate our kids uh, there because you know then they could go to a French school in China and have the Chinese culture from you know being in China whereas there are no fr Chinese schools in France uh, so we couldn't run that sort of uh, of, um, of of system there um, and after living a few years in China uh, on discovering the country, traveling everywhere in the country, um, I got more and more annoyed of what I was reading about, uh, about China in Western media uh, because it was so completely different from what I was seeing on the ground. Um, and that's basically out of you know sheer frustration that I started tweeting about it. Uh, and... Uh, that's still what drives me today. I have, uh, you know, I gain absolutely nothing from it. Uh, I actually lose quite a lot from it uh, because it distracts me from my job and, uh, and I get insulted as everyone copiously on Twitter and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm still just uh, re annoyed that. Uh, uh, that people get uh, get China so so wrong, uh, which I think is. Um, actually mostly bad uh, to us, uh, Westerners, uh, less bad for, for China because, uh, um, you know, uh, China is uh, growing in importance. It's, uh, it's already by some measure the most important uh, economy in the world. Uh, you know, a lot of the future uh, 
uh, will be uh, will be somehow shaped by China. And if we keep understanding the country so completely uh, in in the wrong way, uh, then you know we act on delusions, on some sort of mirage of a fake image that we make ourselves in in our mind. And uh, on, when you act on, uh, on 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 a mirage, on on illusion, then by definition your 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 actions are counterproductive because they're not. Uh, grounded in uh, in truth in reality and uh, and so it's a, yeah all the stuff that uh, that's frustrate me and that's why I'm uh, I'm vocal about this yeah i totally understand that i mean at some point uh, what we read in the news is just so frustrating that there's no other way but to kind of do ourselves a little bit of like yeah. reporting about how things are or how we perceive them uh, th let me ask you so you know, I've been living now con constantly in Japan for 10 years and I haven't made it to China once, not even once. Okay. And it's a shame. Okay. It's a shame. And I'm ashamed for that. But um, how is it? What's the difference um, between how China is portrayed and how you are experiencing it? I mean, everything is different. It's uh, it's extremely hard to uh, to explain it in, uh, you know, in uh, in a few words. I mean, the image that we have of China in uh, in the West is that of uh, you know some sort of dystopian police state where you're constantly you know monitored by the authorities and uh, you have zero freedom and so on. Uh, but that's absolutely uh, not true. Like um, uh, I, I think you you have even less policemen uh, per population than in most Western country. I was in in in, in France. Uh, this summer, um, and I was amazed at the number of policemen that I was seeing around the street. You know, most of them with uh, very heavy guns, especially since it was the uh, the Olympics and so on. Like you never see that in China. You actually see quite quite few policemen. They don't carry weapons. Um, and, and you regularly see Chinese citizens. Uh, you know, not hesitating to uh, argue or even fight with police. There is no fear there, uh, at least very, very little fear. So it's uh, it's extremely far from uh, from a police state. Um, uh, and then you have all those myths, like uh, you know, the social credit score is uh, is one of them. That uh, you know, all, all, all Chinese uh, uh, people would have a, a score that monitors their daily actions on that based on what they do on a daily basis then you know their score improves or or reduces and it's a way of uh, you know uh, the government will have to to have total control over them that simply doesn't exist it's a complete myth there is no social credit score in, in china that's not true uh, so and you know like um, you feel in in many respects more free in China, at least that's what I felt that uh, than in the West. I'm very used to traveling in China. People who follow me on Twitter know that. Uh, what I typically do is that I rent a RV, you know, those uh, mobile homes, and, and just drive around the country, uh, provinces after provinces. Um, I've done several trips like that. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I never get checked by the, by, uh, by the police. In fact, in all my RV trips, I've, I've never even had my, my paperwork checked. Uh, so I can go anywhere, uh, park anywhere, which is not the case when you drive an RV in, uh, in France, for instance. Uh, you know, people are extremely friendly. Uh, I mean, it's, it feels like freedom, right? It's, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, the country is extremely safe. Um, you know, you need to consider freedom as a whole. Uh, so freedom is not only about, uh, uh, you know, uh, free individual freedom, but it's also about uh, uh, some collective freedoms, like uh, freedom from fear, for instance. Like, if you're afraid of uh, of walking in the street, uh, how free are you? You can't even go on the street, right? Uh, which is not the case in China. Like, uh, I'm not afraid if my daughters uh, go walk in the street late at night wearing a mini skirt anywhere in China. Like, uh, no one has that fear because it's uh, because it's so safe. And then, you know, the Chinese government has done a lot of effort around uh, poverty alleviation. 
uh, <clears throat> th that's also to me an aspect of, uh, of freedom. Um, actually, um, Franklin Roosevelt, the, uh, the, the the American president, at some point he had that uh, famous speech of his on on the four freedoms, uh, and he included freedom from need in those freedoms. To him, that was a core definition of freedom, like uh, making sure that uh, you know people are uh, there are there are no people living in poverty because when you're poor. Uh, how free are you really? You, you're you're basically a slave to your condition. You, you are uh, you're uh, the only thing that you can think about is uh, you know where you're going to sleep that night if you're homeless. Uh, uh, how how can you get your next meal? Th there is no freedom there. So th the fact that the the government has done so much around poverty alleviation that you see virtually no homelessness in China. Uh, it's extremely rare probably an order of magnitude of 100 times less than uh, if you go in France or, or, or the US, for instance. Like That's that's a real plus in terms of, of, of freedom when it's broadly defined in, uh, in China. Uh, so sh sure, on, on freedom of speech, they have a, a, a slightly different view to us. Uh, like uh, it, it is true that uh, the press is, uh, is very controlled, for instance, but even that's uh, very much exagger exaggerated. Like, uh, for instance, in Shanghai, I was living in, uh, in a residence uh, with a lot of, um, uh, that was quite expensive. So there were a lot of uh, entrepreneurs living there, like quite wealthy people in China who, uh, you know, uh, it was a time when uh, there was a bit of a crackdown on, uh, on, um, on, on, on business, uh, at least, you know, against, uh, uh, you know, monopolies like uh, Alibaba and so on. They, they wanted to, uh, uh, to, I guess, uh, break those monopolies and so on. And that scared a lot of entrepreneurs. Like everyone was complaining about that, like openly, like uh um, they will not get uh, any issue for that. Like uh, people are in their daily conversations are not afraid to uh, to criticize the government. Now, what you can not, not do, and that's true, is you can't uh, you know create a political movement that's uh, uh, aimed at uh, um, you know throwing out the government and so on. But uh, in daily speech, even on on social media, people uh, don't hesitate to do it, and even. Often, uh, criticism is openly encouraged uh, by uh, by the government. Like uh, they have those forums. I posted the link sometimes on uh, on my Twitter feed where they call for criticism. Like tell us what's not working in the country, and then they have those uh, lists of thousands of comments, and and they try to address every single one of them. So it's it's very uh, mischaracterized often all those things. It's 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 quite interesting to me. I mean, and we get a lot of these reports also from other people on on different social media. Danny Haifong, I think, who recently traveled there. Although I'm not sure, was it him or I think um, I think of somebody else. But yeah, then, you know, like him. several people yeah. who go to China and report how yeah. is it there, and you see it's it's different from how it is being portrayed. How do you explain to yourself that apparently so many people in Western media have this urge, this need to unearth? All of this this dirt that they believe there is um, that's built upon the notion that China must be by default bad. When in fact, as any country, as any place on earth, you've got things that are nice and that work well, and you have things that are bad and they don't work well. And probably we could improve that, but and the world could be more perfect, but it isn't. And you could report on that but we only we only at the, at least at the moment in the big uh, news media we get one story you unearthed one this morning right on the financial times where a financial times reporter who lives in china reported something utterly ridiculous but that didn't seem to register with her can you tell us that story maybe yeah yeah so the, the financial times yesterday wrote an article uh, uh, claiming that last year only 1202 uh, new businesses were created in China. Um, um, I mean, that's a crazy number. Uh, only right. 1,200 on two new businesses in the whole of China uh, in, for, for, for the entire year of, uh, of 2023. And, um, and I checked what the actual number is. 
the actual number is, uh, um, according to chain statistics, uh, 32 million. Uh, so uh, literally 30,000 times more. Um, and even if you apply just uh, basic common sense, uh, you could see that this number is obviously uh, not, not true. Like uh, that specific journalist was living in Beijing. She could just have looked at the number of new restaurants that's, uh, you know, independent restaurants that are opening around her in Beijing. I'm sure she would have noticed, you know, uh, in, in the whole year, uh, quite a few hundreds. Um, you know, if you extrapolate that to the whole of China, you can see that, uh, you know, just in the restaurant industry, there are probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of, uh, of, of new businesses created. And, um, you know, you could also think, look at the US, if you don't trust chain's number, look, look at the US, how many businesses were created there last year? I checked, it's 5.5 million. Uh, so does it make sense that when in the US, 5.5 million new businesses were created last year, when you compare to China, which is a country that has four times the population and that grew at twice the rate, only 1,200 businesses will be created. Like it, it doesn't make any, it's it, 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 even, you know, if, if you just think about it from a pure common sense uh, basis, it's uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. Yet that journalist wrote that, she's based in China and that article went viral with some extremely, uh, prominent people sharing it uh, without, you know, double thinking the number that that sounds so, so crazy. So yeah, it's extremely common. And, this type and of I think her China. whole, her whole point was to say that, you know, China is going through horrible, like economic stagnation, right. And decline. And it's so much less than the years before. So this chimes in into the story of like China is suffering. China is economically unstable, which we hear yeah. a lot. And uh, I, I don't know if I can trust any of that, although I do have Chinese students and friends who say like, no, the, the economy isn't great at the moment. There are problems. But I, I mean, why this urge like to, to, to get things this wrong in order to yeah. trash talk China? Why? Yeah. So first of all, it's true. The economy, I mean, China is in a transition period, I think, where it's... Uh, it's it's changing its uh, its its business model basically, where um, a lot of it was based on real estate, uh, famously, and it grew into quite uh, quite a big bubble. Uh, I think like up to forty percent of China's GDP was based on uh, on real estate, which was unsustainable. So they're deflating that uh, that bubble. And it was also, you know, uh, China up to today was uh, largely based on, you know, uh, China doing sort of the low value added dirty work for uh, other companies. So if you, if you look at the iPhone, for instance, which was produced in China, uh, China was making the phone, uh, uh, but um, at the end for each iPhone sold, only like less than 10% of the uh, of, of, of the sale price was, was going in China's pocket. And uh, you know, 90% of it, uh, the rest was uh, was for American companies, iPhone and, uh, uh, for Apple. Um, and, and China is trying to you know <clears throat> go up the value chain, uh, you know, making its own phones, uh, famously its own cars, uh, EVs, which was a you know, huge shift during COVID where China became the first uh, exporter in the world of cars. And it's trying to do that for, uh, for all industries becoming an innovation powerhouse and so on. So, so it's a major shift in their economic model. So yeah, it's a transition period where things are, are, are a bit uh, difficult uh, because it's, it's not easy for an entire country to pivot, right? Um, but the, the picture isn't, uh, you know, that gloomy either. It grew at 5.2% last year, which is twice the, the rate of growth at the US. It's much less than it used to be in the past, but it's still, it's still growing at, uh, you know, a decent rate. The IMF predicts, I think, I can't remember, it's either 4.5 or 5% uh, this year. So it's not that bad, and it's certainly not uh, to a stage where new business creation has completely dried up. It's, it's not true that there are only 1,200 companies 
creator in the whole of uh, of China um, last year. Um, and to answer your question on why, um, I think it goes back very very deep uh, in in our in our nature as uh, as Europeans uh, as as Westerners. Really, we have. Uh, Always had um, a, a, a need to uh, proselytize, to 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 define the world, the world into, you know, those who've seen the lights. Uh, you know, I think it stands from our Christian roots, even even maybe earlier than that. Those who have the the, the faith, uh, who've seen the light, who understand the truth, and the others uh, who you know. Um, Need to be converted, uh, right? Uh, we we are very missionary in in our view of the world, and those would need to be converted uh, before they're converted. They're they they're they're in the wrong. They're they're bad, uh, and, and and we constantly need to convince ourselves of that. Uh, so much so that we we create um, you know. All, we have to create all those myths, all those fake images to to justify that for us. I think, at, uh, in uh, in quite a deep, profound way, uh, that is the root cause of uh, of the issue. That 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 kind of uh, of, of cultural mindset, and then of course uh, you have uh, you know. <clears throat> uh, the fact that uh, you know how those journalists are are educated, the, the schools they go to. Like I looked a bit at the profile of that uh, specific uh, FT journalist. Um, she, uh, I, I think, she doesn't speak Chinese. Uh, she hasn't studied China. She goes to the country, you know, purely from the West, having been raised in that uh, environment where. We, uh, liberal democracy, the way we view the world is the only correct one, and China is wrong. And, uh, and so when you go with that mindset, which is very close-minded, then um, even though you don't, uh, that's unconscious in some way, uh, you try to justify that way when, when you're in China. Yeah, and it, 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 maybe it's also worth saying that it happens very, very, very quickly for foreigners, especially us like Westerners and Europeans in, in Asia, to flock together and to build their little bubbles. And even yeah. though we live here, we, we always are in our little English-speaking bubbles yeah. the whole time. It happens so fast. It's exactly yeah. the same as when like Europeans complain about those foreigners who don't want to integrate and they always hang out with their own gang those horrible people yeah. it happens exactly to us it's like a sociological yeah. phenomenon and then living in china doesn't mean that she understands actually that, that she knows what's going on which is very different if you're actually married to a uh, somebody from exactly. there then uh, you, you get yeah. a completely different surrounding right exactly so living in china i actually noticed uh, you you're exactly right uh there was a, a big group, even people who had been there for years and years, uh, who uh, simply stayed in their bubble, in their expat bubble, and and therefore you know didn't understand the country uh, better at all uh, than if they had stayed in uh, in the West. Um, and then there are people, most often you're right, people who are married to a local um, and therefore, you know, have to uh, mingle with locals, have to make an effort to understand uh, the local culture and so on. Then they start to, um, uh, to, to understand the culture, understand the history, see the world through uh, the Chinese eyes and uh, on. And then, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the 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 basically step out of the matrix. Yeah. So, so in a sense, even the reporters over there, they're still part of the same bubble and of the same narrative. The interesting thing to me is that the narrative can shift over time. And one of the things I found fascinating is that you know, if you compare how Japan was treated by the United States in the 1980s. It's similar, not as bad, way not as bad, but the tone was the same. It's like when Japan was the second largest or about to become the second largest uh, economy in, GD, uh, in GDP terms um, yeah. uh, uh, and, and started exporting 
a lot to the US. There were these moments when US senators trashed, like they used hammers and trashed Sony um, ca cassette recorders, right? And there was, they, they put a lot of pressure on Japan to curb its exports and Japan did follow. And then, and then, and then it went away, it went away. And now Japan is that, that, that good little ally and all of this is is gone and forgotten, but and now China is get, is getting all the beating based yeah. mainly on its economic performance, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I completely agree. And, um, and, and another interesting observation around that is actually it didn't always used to be the case. If you study uh, Western history in the long run. Um, for instance, uh, like in the 16th, 17th century, there were a lot of um, uh, you know Western thinkers like Matteo Ricci, for instance, uh, who was a Jesuit missionary, uh, who went to China and you know really made a lot of effort to understand Chinese culture. Then he translated all the Chinese classics into Latin, send them back to Europe. And there was genuine interest in, in the culture, so much so that uh, actually China at the time became a, a, a model for many Enlightenment uh, thinkers, like uh, Voltaire, for instance. Um, he, he, because he read the Chinese classics, he was absolutely in love with uh, Confucius. In fact, the only portrait that uh, he kept in his study uh, was that of, of Confucius, which uh, he thought was uh, the best thinker the, the world ever had. So we used to, uh, to be more open. And I think uh, part of the reason why uh, we used to be that way and we're not that way anymore is because we could not afford not to be that way. Uh, back then, uh, because we were living in a world that was truly multiple at the time. In fact, China was a much bigger power uh, for most of history than uh, than anyone else. It was, uh, you know, if you look over the, 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 the long uh, arc of history, uh, China was always the biggest, uh, most powerful, uh, most powerful country, except uh, for the past 250 years or so. And then came the Industrial Revolution, which gave us uh, unfair advantage, really, uh, and enabled uh, you know, us, like uh, the Spanish and Portuguese first, the British after, and so on, to, to conquer most of the world. And we lost that need to understand others because we could just submit them uh, with, with our raw comparative power. We could just, you know, we, we, we don't want to understand you. We can just, we don't need to, we can just submit you. Uh, and I think we are going back to a world bit by bit uh, where that need to understand others will uh, will increase more and more because we, we won't be able to submit them anymore. So I'm actually, uh, in, in the long run, I'm actually quite optimistic uh, if we don't kill ourselves in a nuclear war or something in, in between mm -hmm. yeah in the process uh, because we will have to simply I'm, 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 gl I'm glad to hear that uh, because it, it, it's kind of difficult to get optimistic takes at the future at the moment um, but this this topic or this this issue of the collective West, let's call it what it is, it's just the white Europeans that then basically genocided three continents and populated them, and, and they still work in the same way. It's not a coincidence that it is Europe, North America, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. I mean, <laughs> just look at us. I mean, yeah. there is a racial component, a clear racial sure. component to this. And yeah. I, I don't yeah. want to to say that it's just race, but so, but something, the way that migration worked, right? And, and force, be it voluntary or forced migration, but do you think that part of that narrative about China, that this is um, consciously done, as in with a purpose? Or is it is it that innate thing uh, that makes us misportray China, misportray Asia in general? Um, if you look at also how the collective West tries to portray um, uh, the, the, the relationship between China and Russia, it's a highly, it's a highly um, nuanced relationship. But in the West, all we really read is this is an alliance. It's like, 
what's your take on on that one, for instance? Um, so there is obviously a mix of both uh, because we know the U.S. spends um, an insane amount in anti-China propaganda. In fact, uh, um, yesterday or two days ago, uh, it signed a bill uh, in Congress uh, that committed, uh, I think it was $1.6 billion in anti-China propaganda uh, for, I think it was the next three years. So we know they spend on, on that's a crazy amount, right? So, uh, because it corresponds to the, to the annual salary of 16,000 journalists uh, paid 100K a year each. I mean, to spend $1.6 billion on propaganda is uh, is huge. You, you, you can really, uh, you know, write a lot of articles with, with, with those types of, uh, of, uh, of amounts. But I genuinely think that... Uh, <clears throat> Most of it is innate uh, for the uh, mechanisms that uh, I was explaining earlier, uh, because we don't have to understand China um, uh, from our history or, or, or our uh, comparative st historical strengths vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, we've been used for 200, 250 years of not having to understand others on, you know, only... Uh, you know, shutting the way we see it on anyone who, uh, the, the way we see the world on anyone who disagrees is by definition bad and uh, we, we don't look further into it. And also that, uh, that, that, uh, that missionary spirit that comes from, from, from uh, our Christian roots uh, where uh, uh, the other is 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 bad. It's good versus evil in the world. And uh, since we're good, then uh, the others are evil until they're finally converted to uh, uh, to become uh, mirrors of uh, of our own image. Uh, so yeah, I think it's it's uh, it is a mix of both. And on China and Russia, I, I think uh, I mean you're completely right. It's a very nuanced relationship. And uh, it's a difficult history as well. Uh, when you study the, uh, the history of, uh, of China with their northern neighbor, I mean, it's uh, it's not for no reason that they, they built the Great Wall, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's because you know they've always been uh, they've always had trouble coming uh, coming from the north, and even during the Cold War, they they, they were actually. Um, armed uh, uh, battles uh, between the Soviet Union and, and China. So it, it is a complicated history. It's the longest border in the world, China and, uh, and Russia. Uh, so, you know, China doesn't want to antagonize uh, Russia, especially at this moment in time uh, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, when it has so much pressure from the West, it's like uh, you know the proposition that's made to China is uh, is kind of ridiculous when 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 you think about it. It's like we want you to turn against your uh, your biggest neighbor, the one you've always had trouble with historically, um, and uh, uh, so so that uh, you know Russia can uh, I don't know lose the war or something. And once they do. Uh, for sure, since you, China, are our biggest threat, we will turn against you. So you will help us save time in uh, in focusing all our efforts against you. Like, why would China do that? Like, uh, that that's not uh, that doesn't make uh, any sense, right? So, so that is the nuance. You need to put themselves uh, you, yourself in uh, in China's shoes. They, they have absolutely no incentive whatsoever to uh, to turn against Russia. But it also doesn't mean that uh, they are actively helping Russia in the war. There are no Chinese soldiers fighting alongside uh, Russian soldiers. Even the U.S. agrees that they are not uh, supplying weapons, uh, contrary to uh, you know other countries uh, to Russia. There is this um, this claim of uh, dual use, uh, whatever that means, because when you look into into the claim, is basically you know. And any help that Russia, uh, the China, sorry, provides to Russia in terms of, uh, you know, even selling cars, uh, you know, cars can then be used, uh, you know, to drive uh, Russian soldiers to the front. And uh, so yeah. it's, uh, 
Yeah, it's just it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, this is serious. A, this is a very old trick. This trick goes back hundreds of years. And actually, in international law, the word for this is not dual use goods. The word is contraband of war. And the oldest trick is whenever you have a, a, a trouble with somebody, then you tell everybody else, the neutrals, that now everything is contraband of war, not just black powder and bullets, but also food and and wheels and clocks, because all of that can be used hypothetically yeah. <laughs> for military yeah. purposes. So this is an old one. And China is, is going, the funny, the, the, the horrible thing is that the West is using that in order to attack China also on, on an, a whole sloth of other, uh, on yeah. other issues exactly. and, and prepare exactly. that, that economic war or, or uh, battle Fight out it. economic war. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I, I had fun at some point looking at uh, um, the sanctions that the U.S. put uh, uh, specifically for this dual-use thing, uh, like which specific Chinese companies and Russian companies they, they provide the they, they sanction, um, and uh, it was very much not related at all to uh, to the war in Ukraine. It was like a uh, uh, big, um, you know, infrastructure project, joint uh, pipelines between Russia and uh, on China, you know, gas uh, uh, projects to supply gas from Russia to, to China, things that could help China economically. Uh, um, you know, I guess, uh, I mean, Russia would uh, have seen benefits as well, uh, get uh, money from it and so on. But it's not uh, like the link to the war in Ukraine is uh, uh, immensely remote. It's uh, it's obvious that it's being used as an excuse to uh, sanction uh, uh, companies in order to uh, contain China. Yeah, but containing China, that's not going to work anymore in a multipolar world, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, I don't think China is uh, is containable, and I think that actually when you attempt to contain China as the West. Uh, because the West is uh, increasingly little in, in the international space, uh, you actually be, build more wars again around yourself as the West than, than you do uh, than you do a, a, around China. It's quite obvious in, in quite a few fields. Uh -huh.